welcome to another 406 Tech Talk. Today we're going to talk about literacy. All kinds of literacy. Literacy is all encompassing. It should actually be in every content area. Well, lead 21, reading strategies, writing, literacy. reading and reading and <laughs> writing and oh. literacy and how to do inquiry groups and your knowledge in a specified area. Reading and writing and speaking and listening. We work on writing, writing workshop, six trait writing, uh, step up to writing. It's about reading strategies, comprehension strategies. So if we're having fun, the kids are having fun. It's all about vocabulary and strategies, which we use for reading and writing. We 21 our inquiry groups and how we can use them and become more effective teachers uh, in our classrooms and teaching literacy. Um, literacy is reading and writing and um, how we interact with text and how we interact with each other. Early learning digital literacy. Well, there's the reading, <laughs> writing, listening, speaking, and viewing. And spelling. And spelling, which fall under your, your traditional thoughts about literacy, but there are other kinds. Mm-hmm. You taught the literacy. Financial literacy. Yep. Did you teach literacy? In I your did, school? scientific literacy. So there's a lot of things that people still don't understand and, and, and people out there who are essentially scientifically illiterate. They might be you know, well-read and well-spoken, but mm -hmm. they have some misunderstandings about science. So science literacy. And in intermediate, I kind of literally taught literacy with learning language and how to take the English that kids have learned and apply it in new ways and understand and break it apart. So, yeah. But now in this job, we kind of teach media Technology. literacy and digital yeah. literacy. So um, we wanted to talk primarily, I think, about the kind of the language stuff, really, because mm -hmm. we have a lot of um, really cool things going on in our district with literacy. And I got to talk with a couple of teachers and one of the literacy coaches, and there's a lot of things happening. So. Let's talk tech stuff, though. Sounds good. What kind of tech stuff do you think goes well with literacy in the traditional way? I'll mention a couple that I've used with groups of students. So one I found is called MoveNote, and what it allows you to do is put um, a recording, a video recording of, of whoever is in front of the camera on their computer alongside something they're reading or viewing whether that be a Google Slides presentation or just a document. And it, it works really well and is recommended for literacy because students can see and hear themselves as they read something or talk mm. about something. So um, it just puts a little recording up in the corner of, of the person. And then I've had some people ask about tools that um, can turn um, text into speech so mm. that people who might be emerging readers or struggling readers could, could hear and see. And so naturalreaders.com is a site I've used with those. It's also an app that you can connect to your Google Drive and it brings in the document and reads. You know, it's, it's that sort of robotic voice that's getting better and better as mm -hmm. time goes on. Um, and so it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty natural. We learned about one similar to that. It was actually an extension for your um, Google Apps mm -hmm. where you could install it on your documents and it can read and write. So you can you have the highlighting tools and there's some annotation tools so you could use it for close reading. But then one of the things you could do is make it play text. So if, you know, you had an article or something and a student wasn't able to read it, it could be read to them. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that's cool. Um, another one that's like that on your Mac computer, and I'm sure on the PC, you can go into the accessibility settings and turn on those either speech to text or text to speech features, which came in really handy a few weeks ago. I went and met with the primary literacy groups, and a lot of their kids aren't readers yet. And so to, to have an article or to have some body of text for them to have read to them mm -hmm. instead of them to try to force themselves to read when they're not ready for it. I think sometimes the simplest things are the best. So just like you mentioned video, even just using photo booth mm -hmm. or using the camera on the iPad are always great. I love SoundCloud for kids to be able to share what they've read or what they learned when maybe they don't have their writing skills. So I sometimes think the simplest things are the best. Mm -hmm. I had a principal um, email me and ask, uh, a student had shared a presentation with him and there were some errors in there and he wanted to somehow record himself reading the presentation aloud to the student, thinking that if the, if the student heard right. what he had written, he would catch those errors. And we, we talked about several tools, I'm not sure what any ended up using, but MoveNote was tossed out there, SoundCloud was mm -hmm. tossed out there as an idea, so mm -hmm. there's a lot of different things that you can do for something like that. 
One thing we wanted to make sure we pointed out was this thing that's sitting on the table in front of us here. This is an Osmo. Um, an Osmo is a uh, set of games and a little attachment that goes onto an iPad where each game, there are currently three, one is um, designed around vocabulary, but each game gives kids an opportunity to learn social skills, practice creative thinking, and really put those literacy it? skills into place. Um, the games really take advantage of those multiple intelligences all at once, the spatial and interpersonal and motor skills. And it's a lot more rich experience than just a touch screen experience like you get with a typical yeah. iPad. Um, they're not sitting hunched over the iPad, they're sitting in front of it and manipulating letters. So we found it to be really popular with primary students as well as intermediate. Um, there's a push actually out there to have primary kids blogging and their classrooms are actually little kids are blogging. Um, in some cases it's the teacher who's blogging and the kids are reading and responding, but in the case of like um, Julie from Newman, mm -hmm. her kids are actually writing blog posts. Yeah. So has she, did she talk about that at all? She, she, she has. It's exciting to watch them and they, they you know, jump right into it and talk about um, what they're doing and, and I made a visit and, and I, was a, I was the title of a blog post because they had to talk about Ooh. what they learned. Um, from our little session together, but they get excited to to share and respond, you know, in those little ways. Um, however, they can express themselves with with you know those those skills, and they're developing familiarity with the keyboard, and I think that's crucial mm -hmm. too, and that's important. Some basic keyboarding skills <coughs> too. So mm -hmm. it's been that's, fun to watch. That's been a big thing I know that a lot of us have been asked is keyboarding. It's starting to be a need in younger and younger grades so that kids can get their ideas out and published to those authentic audiences but they don't have the they don't even know where the letters are yet <laughs> much less know where to put their fingers and how to make them all move so there's that and as far as navigating a tool um, little things that we've seen teachers use to get information out to their students like ThingLink, for example, mm -hmm. or Symbaloo. So they have the tools right there for the students that takes away that barrier of getting the students to find the resources. So that's helpful too. But Julie's doing great things with yeah. her blogging and yeah. I've seen intermediate people. I used Blogger when mm -hmm. I was a teacher. Mm -hmm. There's all kinds of tools to do that. So what about non-tech stuff though? Literacy and Spanish complement each other. Este es casi lo mismo porque en inglés enseñándose a cómo leer y cómo es escribir es lo que es, es, es español, es así, es, es como se aprende el español, es lo mismo. No más que en enseñando español hay una variedad de otras cosas que tenemos que enseñar junto con cómo leer y hablar el español y escribir el español. They're one and the same, because if you're talking about reading and writing, um, in, Sp in uh, Spanish we teach the foundation of a language, so that goes right alongside it, along with many other components. Kim, yes. how are you able to use your literacy background in your new position as a history teacher? You know, in thinking about that question, there were three components that correlate very well together. The first one is their reading comprehension, mm -hmm. because they're able to understand cause and effect. Because if one stops to think about it, that's a lot of what history is. Mm -hmm. um, this argument led to this battle that led to this treaty that led to, you know, the, the next event that happened in history. So by them putting their reading comprehension skills together, they're able to understand where our country has come from. Another way that this has worked is with their writing skills because they have to take examples from the history book but they also have to incorporate that into their opinions, um, their values, their way of thinking in order to write with clarity. Um, and the third component is their speaking skills because teaching eighth graders they're very, or most of them are very vocal and they're anxious to share their opinions, their ideas, their values. And to have a student speak clearly is important. What is the most important thing your stu students learn in your Espanol class? El mundo es un libro y ellos que no viajan es como leer solamente una página. The world is a book and those who do not travel read only one page. Oh. 
I love that because it is. It, it just, it just so, so, so much. So what do you think is like the most important thing that they learn in history? Not only is history cause and effect, but is also a point of view. Um, if you were to take the Revolutionary War, you've got the American um, colonists and how they viewed what was happening, but then you take the, the British's point of view and how they feel things were happening. So I think that they need to learn how to respect each other. And this is a quote that I learned from Casey Visser, and I love this, and that's the fact that um, he says, freedom is not free. And when I took, I was able to go to Washington, D.C. with a group of faith leaders a couple of years ago, and that was very powerful to see the life-size statues of the of Korean army men, mm -hmm. and to realize that all of those people in World War I and World War II and in Vietnam and in Korea and Desert Storm, that you and I have the freedom that we do because there was some person that gave their life. And I will always hold that quote dear that um, freedom isn't free. There are a lot of sacrifices that, are, that, are made, that were made for you and me. a trick question. <laughs> well, what do you think? I bet the person I would go to to answer that question is one of our literacy coaches. Well, let's ask her. Susan okay. Iron. In the cavernous abyss of the Lincoln Center, you'll find a cheerful area, part-time home to Billings literacy coaches, including Susan Iron. Surrounded by books, bins full of literacy materials, reading manuals, and other tricks of the trade, I caught up with Susan to ask her, who are you and what do you do? My name is Susan Iron and I am a literacy coach. I work in K-2 classrooms, um, not only with the teachers, but I also get the opportunity to teach the students. Having taught for 37 years, Susan still feels the love when it comes to her job. Her favorite part? I think the favorite thing, you know, and it could be either with adults or with children, it's just with us as learners, is when you see that aha moment, that light click on, and you see the, okay, they've got it moment. That, that's satisfying, regardless of what age we are. Billings Public Schools literacy coaches have been around since the good old days of reading recovery, which is further back than many in the district have experienced. After reading recovery and the interventions in the primary classrooms and, and kind of us latching on to that, I show you we do it together independent practice theory, that it was good for kids, we were, find, we were assessing um, students and finding out where they were, firming up again and moving forward, next steps, and we just, and at the time, Gail Serwell was our curriculum director. She felt like, geez, everybody is coached, you know, whether it's the golfer or, you know, a resident in the hospital, you know, that you, you um, are constantly learning. It's a lifelong process that you're going to those that have more experience than you or different experience than you. In order to help develop young readers, writers, listeners, and speakers, Susan works with their primary level teachers to hone their skills learn best practices, and gradually become masters in the education of literacy. As long as I've been doing this, um, I find that my teaching changes every year. Hopefully I'm better every year, and things become more clear to me. I think one of my goals is, you know when you're a teacher that you have to understand things a little bit better if you're going to teach it. Well, I think that constantly is happen happening to me. I'm constantly looking for a leaner, cleaner way to get people to that next step and they don't have to fumble around so much. And there are many, many ways, that's the challenge, to get to that next step. That's what's so trying and yet so exciting about teaching. In her long career, Susan has seen it all, from whole language to phonics and everything in between. You know, I've been teaching long enough and was in school as a youngster, you know, to go from the, the phonics to no phonics, from, you know, heavy skill and drill to whole language and back again. And the reality is in literacy, if you're look, thinking of primary, that you, you're going to have a balance, which is what we were focusing on, a balance of all of those things. You know, this is an alphabetic language. We cannot learn to read and write without it. Um, and yet there is that other holistic comprehension piece 
Susan's bird's eye view of the district has given her an opportunity to see how technology has helped take student and teacher learning to the next level. You, you know, I was in a classroom today and um, they're in Unit 5, they're doing um, celebrations and it was celebrations of your country and the little reader that they're doing is Martin Luther King. Well, what could we do tomorrow? We could look at a quick um, video of his very famous speech, you know, right in front of Abraham Lincoln and, and on the, you know. Susan's biggest message to educators of all subjects? I think, you know, the scaffolded model, always keeping that in mind in my teaching when I'm evaluating how am I doing, how are the teachers doing, how are the students doing, I'm always trying to figure out where I am in that scaffolded model. I, we, you, and I think our we has gotten broader. And then balance, you know, the balance of, you know, creativity and skill and drill, you know, comprehension and phonics, mm -hmm. um, balance of whole child versus curriculum. Thanks, Susan, for all you do to help us tall students find that balance when it comes to the literacy needs of our young students. You know, it's just, we can, it is so, it is so exciting. Just. It is exciting. It's pretty dang fun. So this was a funny coincidence. Your primary tilt group the other day was meeting and had scheduled some classroom observations. And it just so happened that I made an appointment to go see one of our primary literacy gurus. And we both ended up in the same room at the same time. Yeah, that was interesting. So we were over at Mark Kane's yeah. classroom over at... McKinley. That's. Uh, I like to call it North McKinley. <laughs> North. Because we've got South McKinley here <laughs> in the Lincoln Center and North McKinley. Some great things happening there, construction-wise, but also literacy-wise. It was fun to to be observers of that. So. Welcome to North McKinley Elementary, where construction noise, the nostalgic sound of creaky early 20th century floors, and the excited participation of eager learners are among a few of the sounds you'll hear. Among the happy cacophony, you'll also hear the voice of first grade teacher, Mark Kane. We're going to work on a couple new spelling patterns, so we're going to practice our handwriting for these spelling patterns. One of the few male primary teachers in the district, Mark uses his leadership skills to lead these miniature citizens in highly engaged learning. Equipped with training in both literacy and technology, among other things, it's easy to see that Mark enjoys all aspects of his job. Seeing those aha moments when they learn to read, I really think that one of the neat things about first grade is I get to see them go from non-readers to readers and watching that progress over the course of the year and uh, seeing the change that happens in a student because they can read and they can read to learn, um, it's a pretty amazing thing to watch. Despite being right in the heart of the current renovations to McKinley School, Mark's classroom is homey, organized, and conducive to learning. Well equipped with technology, Mark uses these tools to make the curriculum and the learning objectives come to life. Technology and literacy have, have really collided in my classroom. I, I use technology um, daily, daily to, to teach literacy. I don't know how, I mean I do know how, but I, I would be certainly losing something very important in my teaching if I lost technology. Um, today when I was teaching uh, spelling and phonics together, um, yeah, the use of the iPad and reflector gave me the opportunity to walk around my room. And um, being able to be right beside a student as they're writing and I'm writing up on the screen is huge. I mean, I, I can encourage a student, I can correct a student, um, I can take a picture of their work and then put it up on the screen and praise the student. Um, there's just so much power in being not having my back to the board. In order to turn his students into readers, writers, listeners, and speakers, Mark effectively and successfully integrates technology, but he also carefully plans good old-fashioned hands-on activities that keep his students challenged and engaged. I mean, we, we still do all sorts of paper pencil work. We, you know, we, we uh, make art and we can write and sand, and my goodness, the way that, you know, there's so many fun methods of uh, tactile and, and, and real-world um, learning to read and write. 
several years of training, experience in both Laurel and in Billings, and simply having a knack for knowing what each student needs to be successful have all helped Mark to plan rich, engaging lessons that capture his students' attention and make them want to learn. When dreaming of the future, it's hard for any of us to predict what kind of skills and resources students will need to have, but teachers like Mark are doing their part to make sure we aim high, not just in technology, but in literacy too. Well, my goal as an educator using technology is to, to look for the areas that are not just uh, fads, but are ways to um, engage students in processes that weren't imaginable before. You know, what are we doing or what, what do we have the capability of doing that would never have been possible? And, um, and to gauge that versus paper and pencil work and to see, you know, is which, which, what place does paper and pencil work and, what, and, and the real traditional model? Because there's a place for it. And what place does um, some innovative learning come in? And I think those things can, can come together. Thanks, Mark, for doing your part to nurture and empower the future of Billings. Put your foot in your boot on, on the, the floor. floor. <laughs> the sounds of oh oh. That Three was. Sounds. I learned that, that day too. I did yeah. too. I think it goes without saying that there are Mark Keynes sprinkled all throughout this district and, and people that are doing really incredible things with kind of old-fashioned skills. I mean, we still have always, as Susan mentioned, had to teach students how to read because we have an alphabetic language. And to see teachers doing that in innovative ways, I think, has been really exciting. So It was fun to watch, you know, the mixture of, of different modalities. So students mm -hmm. using just a traditional whiteboard mm -hmm. to write and then introducing a few iPads and they got to have their their answers shown on the screen and, and it was just fun to watch that blend of, of yep. traditional and, and digital. And I'm glad you brought that up because one of the tools he was using, which is very simple, um, was Reflector. And he uses Reflector and Air Server and we're going to show kind of a head-to-head -head on that. But he was walking around with his iPad reflecting up onto the screen what he was wanting the students to do on their whiteboards but then also when a student did something that he wanted to show he would take a picture of it and put the students work up there kind of like we used to have to do when we were tethered with a good old document camera he was able to be walking around and be mobile around his room doing that and then he as you said he handed an ipad to a couple of students and simultaneously they were both able to project their image so using reflector he was kind of taking the power of what was happening in an analog way and make it digital that was really cool to see so on my screen you can see what my ipad looks like mirrored in reflector and on my screen you can see the same thing but you'll notice that i don't have the cute ipad looking frame around mine as shelly does mine is just a a window right the other thing I noticed that's different is, boy, your icons are quite a bit bigger. Ah, I can take the size of my window and shrink it down mm. or make it bigger. So if I want it to be um, smaller, the icon's smaller, I can make it look that way. Yeah, and I don't have that option mm -hmm. in Reflector. Um, I know for mine, I can turn it vertically. Portrait? Mm-hmm. Yep, and I can do that as well. In Reflector, a huge thing is being able to set the password. Can you ah. do that in Air Server? Yep. Yep. And same here. I went to Reflector and Preferences to type in a password. This is extremely important so your students don't take over your screen mm -hmm. at any time. That happened to me last night when I was doing a class for some teachers at Beartooth. Yes, All of a sudden so I funny. looked at my screen and I went, those are not my kids. <laughs> Yeah. Um, what other options do you have there in your preferences? Let's sure, compare let's those. Sure, let's look here. I have launch full screen. Mm -hmm. I can change the, the color of the background. 
Uh huh. How about you? I don't see anything like that unless it's in advanced. Nope. Mine is you. What you see is what you get. Okay. I know here too. You can change in under device mm -hmm. on my toolbar. I can not show that frame, that iPad frame. Ah. If I yeah, if I want to, I can also change the skin color to be white, silver, gray, whatever it might be. So depending on the color of your device. Right. Or the kid's device because mm -hmm. you want it to look mostly like theirs. Okay. And then let's open an app and see how it behaves. Sure. Which app shall we do that we both have the same? Do you have Edu Creations? I do. I'm going to pull down my... Search? Mm -hmm. My Spotlight. And I love education so much that I actually have it on my toolbar. I've had a lot of teachers ask about can they, with an interactive device like a Mimeo projector, can they control the iPad from their board? Oh. And the answer to that is no. You right. can only control your iPad from the iPad. So right. the iPad ends up being an interactive device in itself. Right. One advantage with Air Server is that it's just a little bit cheaper, less expensive. You can get, this is really messy, but you can get five reflector license for $50 ah. as well. So you can do the grouping with reflector. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, another thing is as far as um, the device that you have to run it on, this I know is 10.6 or higher. Oh. Whereas I think reflector has to be a little bit higher version, 10.8. 10.8 for a reflector? Mm -hmm. Okay. And we have that all on the spec sheet there where it compares because another way to to reflect your device onto your computer is with the, the adapter, the VGA right. um, adapter to right. the cord. Um, Which is that VGA adapter is almost 40 bucks yeah. I think now. And one thing I think we should point out as far as both of these also is it's not an app. This, right. They're both called like the reflector app. Mm -hmm. But it's actually a piece of software you install on your computer. Other than that, they do almost the exact same thing. It's just whichever one um, either you or your principal chooses to pay for for you. Right. Or you decide to buy for yourself. You had to pick or you got to pick. What would you pick? Well, right now I'm really struggling with reflector connecting. So mm -hmm. I think I would probably try Air Server. How about you? I feel the same way. I really, really like reflector because of the way that it looks and the way you can share screen. But I've had some experiences lately where it's been very quirky yeah. and I can't always get it to launch where I haven't, haven't had any trouble with Air Server. So hopefully that will help. Yes. I know we've all had um, teachers who have expressed the desire to go and observe other oh, teachers teach yeah. if oh. if someone would be willing to have people in and it doesn't have to be a show it's just what you normally do um, we only really get to see what we do so when you can get out to another building and just see a different environment and different experiences as Susan mentioned different experiences are sometimes so helpful in our development as as becoming more literate in mm -hmm. our careers. So if you have a classroom, anything going on in there, it doesn't have to be anything special, but that you would be willing to have some teachers come and observe, yeah. let us know. We would be ever so grateful. Mm -hmm. We're also gearing up for the tech fair coming up in April. We've sent out a plea for presenters, but if there's something that you would like to show that you're doing, we have students who are going to come and do demonstrations with teachers this year. Yeah, so we would love to, the more the merrier, anything that's going on out there that you would like to either see or that you would like to show, mm -hmm. if you know, send that along our way. And feel free to pair up with someone. You don't have to go it alone, so you can team up with someone and present something. That's, and it's only 30 minutes. Yeah. <laughs> 30 minutes seems like forever when you're watching this show, but <laughs> when you're up in front and talking about something you know, 30 minutes flies. So I think for our next show, this has come to my attention in the last couple weeks. What exactly is technology integration? Anyway, we each, all three of us have a job that's based on technology integration, but what exactly is it? So we'll talk about that. Yeah. There have been lots of articles across my news feeds about that same topic, that, mm -hmm. you know, that using it's not necessarily integrating it. So all those different discussions we'll dive into. We'll give you a hint about the, the SAMR model and mm -hmm. TPAC and this mysterious other language. Yes, because acronyms are great. L-O-L. <laughs> <laughs>